Welcome. This is the training for the Northern Virginia Salt Management Strategy, or SAMS. It's an exercise to go over winter salt management uh, techniques for salt applicators. An overview of the training that we'll be presenting today, we're starting with a background on why manage salt application. We'll be going over uh, available technologies and techniques and best management practices or BMPs for salt management. Um, and the ultimate goal of this training, and you'll hear us talk about this quite a bit today, is finding a balance between safety, economy, and the environment. My name is Jenny Sneed, and I'm a water resources engineer with A. Morton Thomas. I have 28 years of water resources engineering and compliance experience working primarily with municipalities and DOTs across the Mid-Atlantic and nationally on topics um, relating to water pollution, including salt. And I previously directed the Office of Stormwater at the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. With me today is Rebecca Murphy. She's the Coastal Program Manager at the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. Rebecca has a background in Chesapeake Bay conservation and restoration, and she currently manages the coastal and bay programming for the Northern Virginia Regional Commission. She previously received a Master of Environmental Management with Water Resources Management as her concentration. So there are a number of different salt management strategies or available tools out there for public. Uh, one of them is the Virginia Salt Management Strategy Toolkit, or SAMS, that we'll be concentrating on today. Uh, it was developed to assist with the Akateek Creek uh, NACL, or SALT TMDL compliance. Uh, and it was developed over several years with a, a significant amount of stakeholder um, uh, involvement uh, and was published in 2020. Uh, there are also several other ones here that we list out here. They're in, in no ways um, exhaustive. One is a sustainable winter management program uh, or a SWIM, which is available in some other areas, uh, largely outside of Virginia, as well as other state guidance documents, so state DOTs and uh, environmental quality agencies um, in some of our more northern states. However, this training focuses on the Virginia salt management strategy that was developed for the Akatee Creek or in the northern Virginia area. So a salt management strategy, what, what, what is one? Well, the, the objective um, is really to reduce the amount of salt that is applied. Uh, it's done. This is done to protect water quality. It's also done to make sure that, um, that roads and sidewalks are, are still maintained for safety. Um, and the goal mainly for a salt, salt management strategy and, and of this training itself is for a salt um, manage, application managers to actively consider the processes that you go through during a winter event. And do you think your current practices are efficient or environmentally friendly practices? And do you feel that there are any areas in which, which, in which you could improve? And so as we go through this training, we are, it is our hope that you will consider what you are currently not doing or have done in the past and think about ways that you can make some changes that could be more environmentally friendly. Next. So why is salting important? Uh, the number one reason is safety. Um, we need to make sure that there is the availability for emergency vehicle access during a winter event. It's also to reduce people getting hurt and slipping and falling on ice and snow. Um, and the objective really is to reduce slipping and falling during and after winter storms or periods of snowfall. It's also an economic uh, reason for, for salting and why that salting is important. Um, employees need access to work to keep the economy moving. We need our businesses to stay open and removing and preventing ice and snow from accumulating on the roads and sidewalks will allow businesses to continue operating during and after winter storms or other periods of snowfall. Um, and the objective really is to keep customers and employees to have access to roads and side sidewalks in a safe manner. Next. There are also negative effects to salting. Um, there's several, they're listed here, the primary ones, polluted drinking water reservoirs. Um, this is especially important for those with salt re restricted diets, such as high blood pressure. Damage over time to vehicles and infrastructure through corrosion of the salt working on metals. 
um, damage and death to ecosystems and wildlife that live in our streams and rivers. Uh, this is especially important, obviously, for freshwater, fi freshwater fish. And then the high costs associated with repairs and restoration of ecosystems and infrastructure. We're going to be going over some of these negative effects in the next few slides. Next. So the first one and one of the primary reasons is the effect on our water quality and our reservoirs here in the region. Um, I have some graphs that I'm showing here um, that show the amount of salt that, and how it has increased over years across the U.S. in terms of use for, for winter snow management. And then the bottom slide shows a corresponding effect of the amount of salt found in some of our aquifers. Um, increased salt usage has been shown to um, uh, in, in, not only accumulate in our um, freshwater systems, but also in groundwater that feeds these systems. So it's almost like a double, double whammy, where even after the salt is applied and that direct um, runoff goes into a, a receding water body, such as a reservoir, it still can persist in groundwater. Um, and continue to feed those water sources. And as a result, we see these increased levels of salt in, in, in our local waters here. Uh, that specifically, that bottom graph in blue shows the aquaquan reservoir numbers and how they are increasing in the region. Next. So salt can also cause damages to vehicles and infrastructure through repeated exposure, which results in corrosion over time. So this infrastructure includes like roads, bridges, parking lots, and other surface that salt is applied to regularly. Um, and corroded vehicles and infrastructure equates to more repairs over time that might not have been needed otherwise. So as an example for this, AAA estimates that the average cost for corrosion from salt is about $500. Um, however, there's also a number of ways that increased salt in our waterways impacts surrounding wildlife and ecosystems. As snow melts or as it rains and snows, salt runs off of surfaces into freshwater streams and lakes. And with that, freshwater aquatic species, including both plants and animals, are typically not adapted to be able to withstand high levels of salt in the water, which can make it lethal to them. So, in turn, over time, this causes biodiversity loss and disruption, um, including loss of habitat. Um, and with this, uh, restoration of these ecosystems and habitats takes a lot of time, and it's also very expensive. Um, so you can see on the graphic to the right how runoff from the surface then enters groundwater, as Ginny described, but it also enters our lakes and streams. And to provide an example of this, we have a video from uh, Be Saltwise where she's going to describe some of those impacts on a stream. For those of you that aren't familiar with the Milwaukee River Basin, it's about an 883 square mile drainage area, and it consists of all these different tributaries and streams and rivers that flow right directly into Lake Michigan. And that makes it very crucial when we're thinking about the chloride pollution problem we have with road salts, because it's a very highly urbanized area with a lot of impervious surfaces and just a lot of concrete. So we're applying all this road salt to keep our roads safe, but when we have our snow melt during the spring runoff events that we have, all of that road salt has accumulated in the snow banks and enters our streams and rivers through these stormwater outfalls. And there's no treatment that happens at all before it enters. It just everything that was on the road, it goes straight into our rivers and stream. What we wanna do is look at this problem from a bottom-up perspective and looking at the sediment bacterial population to assess what the ecosystem health at that particular stream or river looks like to tell us if it's imperative chloride or not. And so we wanted to see if we could isolate out halophilic bacteria. The halophiles require the presence of salt to grow. So we can go into a stream or river and we can grab a water sample and we can take a chloride reading or a conductivity reading. We were able to isolate out these organisms, these halophiles out of a freshwater system. And that's concerning because I think it suggests that we're putting too much salt into our streams that these guys are able to grow. So there's a lot of different 
creative things that people are researching on different alternatives that we can utilize to cut our chloride emissions and our streams and rivers down. And so we have different brining technologies that the city of Milwaukee does. And this consists of a 23% sodium chloride solution that is, so it's dissolved in water. And then we spray it onto the roads instead of just applying the dry salts, because you can imagine the dry salts just bounce around off the pavement and end up maybe not where we actually want them to. And we end up using more material in the end. So the, the idea with the brine technologies is we can accurately apply it. And then we can also keep the roads safe by doing that as well. And we're also cutting how much salt we're using. Therefore, there's not as much chloride entering our waterways. And we'll go ahead and touch on some of that brining technology later on in the presentation. Right, so we've gone over the three main, um, I guess, factors really with winter maintenance and the use of salt. And, um, you know, obviously we're using the salt for safety reasons and to keep the economy moving. Um, but we also would like to uh, protect the environment better and finding that balance of applying the right amount of salt at the right time uh, to keep, provide safety, to keep the economy going, but also protect the environment. And a lot of what we'll be talking about here today are brining techniques and other techniques, best management practices for salt application that can help to achieve that balance. But one thing, oh, I'm sorry, could you go back, please? Sure. So um, one, one, one of the impetuses for um, this training and why we're here today um, was because um, there was an environmental standard or TMDL that I'll talk about on the next slide, total maximum daily load um, or environmental standard that was established to help uh, encourage the redu re reduction of salt um, to the watershed. Um, it was an actual limit that was developed for salt or a goal uh, for a lower number of salt to be applied in the Acting Creek region specifically. And to help achieve this, a salt management strategy, the SAMS that we've been, we will be talking about and have mentioned in this training, um, was developed. And it was to limit the salt application and to reduce the amount of salt runoff into our rivers and streams. Um, it was to go over uh, technologies and techniques um, that could be used in this region as best management practices to reduce that amount of salt. And it also called for this training. Um, to discuss about how to apply salt to pave services in efficient and eco-friendly friendly ways. Next. So how was it specifically regulated? I'm going to go over that a little bit at a high level. Um, there's the Clean Water Act, uh, which supersedes uh, water quality um, regulations uh, and rules for um, water quality discharges. Uh, that was a federal authority. Uh, that's given to some of the states in, across the United States, and Virginia is one of those states. And so that authority specifically in Virginia was given to the Department of Environmental Quality to run Clean Water Act programs here in the state. And as part of that, uh, they are called to establish it and enforce pollutant limits on, um, on specific pollutants that are determined to be at too high of a level in specific watersheds. And those limits are called total maximum daily loads or TMDLs. They are pollution diets, if you will. They are um, limits that um, demonstrate what a water quality, uh, what, what a water body can tolerate of a specific pollutant and still maintain um, that quality required to support um, life. There are salt specific uh, as a pollutant total maximum daily loads in more of our northern states, uh, Minnesota, New Hampshire, Washington, and Maine. And now they have now moved down the, the coast uh, to our state specifically, um, with the first one being the Akating TMDL. And you can see the watershed specifically here in green of the water of that um, Akating Creek watershed. Uh, and that's where this uh, total maximum daily load specifically is has been developed. Um, and it was the first here in Virginia. Next. So the process of how one of these total maximum daily loads is developed, I have a little overview here. Uh, it starts with water quality sampling and sampling in a water body uh, to determine if a pollutant level is too high or if it's if it's just right or you know it, if there's an issue. Um, and based on those water quality samples, uh, if a water uh, is uh, 
de determined to be impaired for that particular uh, pollutant, then uh, it can it is classified as impaired by the DEQ. And at that point, they will develop a total maximum daily load and go through that process where they will determine what a waste load allocation could be for that pollutant, which is point sources such as factories and other direct um, uh, discharges to the water body or to the watershed. Um, and these are maintained through um, specific permits under the Clean Water Act. Um, they're National Pollutant Discharge and Elimination System permits. NPDES, and here in Virginia, we call them Virginia Pollution uh, Discharge and Elimination Permits. And we also develop as part of that process a load allocation. And these are for non-point sources such as agricultural, forests, and open space where the runoff is not concentrated like it is in a point source, but instead is more found in runoff from a rain event. Next. This is um, a a picture of all the impaired waters as of 2008. So there have been more, unfortunately, listed since then um, in Virginia by the DEQ. And as you can see across the state, we have a high level of waters that have been impaired for one pollutant or another. Um, and as DEQ works through the process of um, determining which ones need a total maximum daily load in the process after a, an impairment has been classified, um, those with the highest levels of impairments are often moved to the top to develop a TMDL. And I show this slide here mainly to just show that um, while we do have water quality impairments across the state, this Akatink Tink Creek in, in the Northern Virginia region was um, rose to the top because of the significance and the issues associated with the water quality impairments for salt. And just wanted to demonstrate that it is um, very important uh, to reduce the amount of salt in this region um, based on the high level of impairment uh, for that area. Next. So there are a number of different TMDLs in Virginia. We're really concentrating on that salt one here today. Specifically, Akatink uh, includes this area here in the gray um, in Fairfax um, is one of the um, main, the Fairfax County and those in Fairfax County, as well as VDOT in the area are those that are responsible for reducing the amount of salt in the Akatink Creek to help it to achieve better water quality. The to total maximum daily load for these um, entities, it's important to say is a maximum extent practical or MEP, which is sort of, it is really a more complicated way of saying that it's a goal for the area to do the maximum possible um, to reduce the amount of salt in the area. And the Salt Management Strategy, or SAMS, that was developed is a tool to achieve the maximum extent practical of reducing the amount of salt applied in the area. So I know this is a bit complicated, but overall, just the process and the technical regulatory reasoning behind reducing the amount of salt in the area um, is, is presented in the TMDL itself. Next. So now we want to start thinking about your own salt operations. So we're going to go ahead and highlight the different types of salt that operators typically use, um, as well as the costs and benefits to each. Um, so first is the most commonly used salt, which is sodium chloride, or what we typically call rock salt, or even table salt when it's in finer granules, a little bit smaller. Um, and rock salt really is the most common type of salt used um, for salt applications for snow and ice management um, because A, it's the cheapest, um, and B, it's typically the easiest to use and is generally pretty effective. Um, however, like we discussed earlier, this type of salt can cause a lot of the significant negative impacts on the environment by increasing the salinity or the salt levels of freshwater ecosystems. Um, and it's also associated with that corrosive damage to vehicles and infrastructure. So although it is still the most common type of salt used, we wanna start thinking about how we can use it more efficiently um, or also think about different methods and types of salt that we could potentially use in the future. So the next type of salt used is magnesium chloride. 
And this type of salt is used less frequently than uh, the common rock salt. Um, and that's because it requires twice the amount to cover an area that rock salt does. Um, so as you can imagine, this equates to A, increased costs, um, and also be additional labor for salt applicators. It takes more time um, to be able to apply this. So why use magnesium chloride then? Um, unlike rock salt, it tends to be safer and more environmentally friendly. Um, specifically, it is less corrosive and um, it raises the salinity of waters less significantly than rock salt. So again, costs and, and benefits to each. Applicators might also use a type of salt called calcium chloride. Um, and typically this is um, applied in areas that are sensitive or already vulnerable to environment, environmental damage, um, such as impaired streams. Um, and this type of salt is used to help minimize that damage and support ecosystem recovery. But with this, uh, Again, calcium chloride is safer for the environment than other types of salt, but it's typically used pretty sparingly because it is significantly more expensive. Um, again, you can see these trade-offs um, between each of the salts um, and applicators should consider how they can best balance that public safety aspect, um, their own costs and environmental protection in the areas that they use the salt. Um, and lastly, I do want to mention one other type um, or application type, which is abrasives or sand. Um, and we'll talk about application methods a little bit further down the line for this. But sand or abrasives can be helpful to use because it helps prevent slipping on certain surfaces, such as sidewalks. Um, however, the cons often outweigh the benefits here. Um, first, it can be really hard to remove sand or abrasives from the surfaces after it's been applied. Um, typically, folks have to come out with something like a broom to brush it off of surfaces. Um, but it also has negative environmental impacts by causing increased sediment to run off into waterways, and this can make the water more cloudy or turbid. Um, the last uh, con to this is that it's also expensive um, and can be hard to obtain in high quantities. So again, it can help in certain situations um, or certain spaces like si sidewalks when you really don't want to use common um, salts, um, but it's not typically the most beneficial material to larger spaces uh, like parking lots. So there are several uh, snow management techniques that we'll be going over uh, today. And uh, much of which one you use when depends on the time frame uh, of, your, of where you are in the snow event, whether it's before the snow or ice uh, occurs, whether it's during the snow and ice event, or if it's after the snow and ice event. And so we'll be talking a little bit on the next few slides about anti-icing and de-icing and, and the difference between the two, as well as snow removal techniques. Next. So anti-icing uh, is a preventive salt strategy where salt is put onto paved surfaces shortly before a winter storm event, thereby preventing the accumulation of snow and ice. And it really works to prevent the snow or ice from bonding with the surface of the road or sidewalk. And so anti-icing um, is before an event, whereas the icing is after an event. And it's a removal strategy where you use the salt um, on the snow and ice-covered roads to increase the speed that it will melt. So there are two different rationales for them and two different ways of, uh, um, or techniques, uh, or several different techniques for the two different um, application times um, and things to consider that we'll be going over in the next few slides. Next. So technologies and hand and mechanical spreaders are one of the primary reason, ways that salt is applied in our roadways in this area. Um, and the type of equipment you use typically varies, um, um, as does the cost. And so you'll see um, a lot of um, applicators choosing to use the lower cost alternatives um, where it makes the most sense. And when you're using these technologies, it's important to look at the manufacturer instructions. Um, a lot of them will have um, specifically 
um, on the package, the recommended acreage and the appropriate quantity for that acreage to apply. It's important to try to stay within the lower ranges where possible of those uh, manufacturer instructions when you're applying salt to uh, try to reduce the amount of salt that you apply, uh, both to protect the environment, but also to save money on the amount of salt you're applying. And also maintenance uh, instructions that come from the manufacturer are important to make sure that your, your, your mechanical or, uh, um, spreaders are maintained properly and are applying things, applying, applying the salt at the appropriate rates. Um, tracking the amount of salt applied is not something that everyone does, but it's certainly encouraged. Um, and here I have um, a number of different um, amounts of, um, of, of salt per um, hour or that and per square feet per hour for the various um, different technologies that are available here, ranging from a shovel to a skid steer. Next. So one of the primary uh, treatments that we're starting to see more and more in the area because it can be effective, um, both uh, cost effectively and also for safety reasons um, is brine treatment. Um, it's typically something you see on roadways or larger acreage um, and the importance of, of it um, being successful is also related, often uh, most um, related to timing of the event, whether it's before an event or after an event. Um, the, the brine is also, that, that you use and, and the technology that you use to apply it can be related to temperature um, and as well as the maintenance of your um, spreader. Um, and again, it's important to amount that, attract the amount of salt that you that is applied. And we'll talk about some of those technologies that actually make that easier, whether it's through calibration or, or other means. Next. Okay, so how can we manage the types of salt that we use, uh, application techniques, and general operations around salt application to, again, create that balance between public safety and environmental impacts? And tools that we use to do so are what we typically call as best management practices, or BMPs, and we'll use that acronym uh, for the rest of the presentation. And BMPs are, again, management practices that aim to maximize efficiency while also minimizing environmental impacts. As the slide notes here, um, these aren't just certain techniques and technologies that support the balance between the two, um, but they also incorporate planning efforts, just as uh, timing of applications, establishing a tracking protocol, and using temperature measurements that we'll discuss further. So really, it's meant to be a well-rounded, comprehensive um, toolkit um, that you're, you'll be able to use to create an effective best management plan as well. And why are BMPs important? Um, first, they improve safety through better planning and operations. You can keep com your community safe. Um, but you're also preventing that exacerbation of excessive salt use that I described. Um, but BMPs also save money. So if you are able to implement some of the practices that we'll discuss further, such as calibration and tracking, um, the hope is that you'll be able to use the correct amount of material, which will save you money in the long run. And building off of that previous slide, um, these practices such as tracking and pre-application planning results in more efficient and also more effective snow and ice management programs. And as a result, again, you're doing these practices more efficiently. Uh, you're also limiting the negative impacts on the environment through decreased salt runoff. So again, we'll touch on how these aspects are incorporated into some of the different best management practices that we'll describe. So to provide an example of localities using best management practices in their snow and ice control operations, um, we're providing an example from the village of Arlington Heights where they're gonna describe some of the tools and, and processes that they use um, that incorporate BMPs.
the village is primarily a customer service organization. People and businesses rely upon the removal of snow uh, for their ability to uh, commute to work, for their children to get to schools via buses, and for people to be able to uh, traverse the thoroughfares through, throughout the village. In particular, the public works people are very important in that regard, and especially our snow removal people. Snow plowing is one of those core services that the, the residents will judge us on. And if you can't do snow plowing well, it doesn't matter what else you do, they'll remember it. You see examples in the city of Chicago where uh, days or even weeks go by before streets get cleared. There are different jurisdictions serving the village of Arlington Heights. We have state roads, county roads, we have private roads for condo associations. During any snowstorm, there are at least five or six different uh, public agencies, including the school districts and the park districts that are doing uh, snow and ice control. Uh, the majority of the arterial routes in Arlington Heights are owned and maintained either by the state Illinois Department of Transportation, we call IDOT, or by the Cook County Highway Department. To complicate things, there are certain roads like Euclid Avenue, for instance, that has multiple jurisdictions on it. The Village of Arlington Heights maintains a section as well as Cook County. We also have quite a few private contractors that uh, plow and salt uh, private parking lots and apartment buildings and shopping centers. If you see your snowplow contractor pushing snow the remnants of the at the end of the driveway or apron back into the streets or sometimes across the street leaving windrows please tell them that that is not permitted and make sure that the snow from your driveway stays on your property if, it's, if, the, if the road is actually covered with snow then you're not getting any help early in november of every year there is a snow day where all the drivers who uh, have routes uh, for snow removal come into the village public works and spend the day learning their equipment, learning the routes. Additionally, when we do a comprehensive check, uh, we do a circle of safety on all our vehicles, our, our plows, our, our salt spreaders. These trucks do get a lot of hours put on them through the winter and, and they do take um, a beating, even though we do take good care of them. Inspecting the range, inspecting the suspension, tires, uh, all the safety equipment, uh, Warning lights, headlights. Uh, we want the vehicle to be on the road as safe as possible without any problems. Snow Day offers us an opportunity to go out and drive our complete route. When they go through their zones on Snow Day, they're going through up and down every single street in their zone to do a good inspection to see what's out there. Like, especially like branches, if there's any branches, obviously when the snow, you know, falls on them, they get lower. Uh, make sure there's nothing that's going to bust a mirror or something. They're looking for that any any work activities have occurred during the summer that they're all wrapped up and the streets are back in condition to be plowed. They give them manhole covers just slightly extended. And, you know, if you go over that at say 20 miles an hour, it's up the whole neighborhood. So um, trying to identify those heads. By attending the snow day, I think it's it shows the public works department that we have confidence in the work they do it, and, and we get many compliments by the process that they go through and how they remove the snow. Before every snow season, we determine how much salt we will need. And we purchase it through a competitive bidding process. A lot of complexity in terms of buying the commodity and managing the commodity. Uh, there's a lot of resource management that goes into this, this project. Uh, we make a purchase each year from the state. Uh, they do a uh, sealed bid process for uh, salt pricing. And then we also do our own bid contract uh, to supplement the state and that way we have two sources to turn to um, generally our own bid uh, we have that salt delivered before the season uh, our dome holds about 60 percent of our average annual usage so um, in a normal average year uh, we're not able to store enough salt for the entire season we have to uh, resupply periodically to make sure we can get through the year. We're not using salt to burn the snow off the pavement. We're using just the right amount of salt to make the streets safe. The science that we have learned in snowstorms has helped us in our decision how much salt to use. 
So usually after when you're doing your curb pass, that's when they tend to drop salt. Um, is when the storm starts, you, you keep it in the truck so you have trash in. So our large trucks are equipped with uh, not only salt, but uh, uh, a liquid that we spray on the salt to uh, reduce the amount of salt that we put down on the street and uh, to get the same uh, result. Our salt trucks are calibrated every year so we can regulate how much salt we're putting down on the street. Often we'll get calls from residents saying, what are the lines on the streets before a storm? And those lines are on the streets are anti-icing that we do. It's uh, we put this liquid down to prevent snow and ice from bonding to the pavement. We can use less salt by using more liquid before a storm. We have three trucks with a big tank on the back. We spray a special liquid on the street that's not harmful, but effective when keeping the snow from bonding to the street or causing ice. Our goal in snow and ice control is to use less salt. We do not anti-ice every street in town. We just anti-ice the main arterial streets. So if we go into a uh, full-blown uh, salting and plowing operation, uh, we could have upwards of uh, 70 people involved uh, in a A team and a B team. You're paired with another driver, and you're both responsible for that zone. Uh, and this is in an effort to always uh, extend our coverage. Uh, there's a lot that goes into it. A lot of people don't realize how complex no operations can be. It's not just the people on the road, so that's an important part of it, but it's also the people that, that look at how many people we need. Is that equipment in, in proper shape? Have we timed our staffing to the appropriate level? All of that goes into it to support those people driving those trucks. During these snow events, uh, it's all hands. Everybody's involved. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's Christmas Day or a birthday party. Uh, it snows, we're out there. Uh, we also use uh, resources from uh, Village Hall. We'll have uh, people from the uh, building department. We use uh, off-duty police officers. It gives us the ability to field uh, around-the-clock operations. A lot of our drivers are from different uh, units within Public Works, uh, forestry, sewer department, water department, uh, building maintenance. Um, what does sometimes take us away from those operations are other emergencies that may come up during a snowstorm response. Uh, examples are um, trees that may come down, branches that may fall, water may breaks. Um, so we have to have a, a team that's flexible, uh, that can respond to those things as well as the main operation for snow and ice control. To be a good snowplow driver, there is formal training that we go through. All of our drivers, uh, we send to training, usually at least uh, once a year, not every other year. They go to a uh, two-day uh, driving course, learn uh, the ins and outs of the truck and uh, the operations of the truck. Um, the trucks are uh, highly technical. Uh, staff is required to go through some training from the manufacturers in order to know how to operate them properly. Uh, it was a little intimidating uh, getting behind the wheel initially, uh, but I was paired with a lot of talented guys at the village who have been doing it a long time and are able to teach me the ins and outs and some stuff that makes your day a lot easier. When there's an impending storm, we go through the trucks and make sure that everything's ready to go. The lights are working, the, uh, the, the trucks are loaded with salt, they're loaded with liquid. We put the nose plows on and they start plowing the streets. There is a lot of stress placed on those trucks. Suspension, frames, and everything. The storms are very unique. Some can be very wet and heavy snow. Some can be very light, which cause big drifts within the town. So weather is constantly changing. It can change within an individual storm. It can change day to day. Freezing rain turning into ice on the road. The big old snowflakes that look like half dollars falling out of the sky. Some of them are really easy, and some of them, uh, you just can't wait till the snow stops. But uh, you just deal with it. Snow Command is a is an office we have in Public Works, but we utilize that as our main central point of communication for both residents as well as our own staff. To, to monitor the weather, we have several different tools in our toolbox. We have Arwis Station, which are weather information systems. We have one on the north and one on the south side of town. Those will be an actual camera on the road. So we can see when the snow or ice starts to accumulate on the roadway. We also have temperature, humidity, which is very important, snow, snow removal, and also wind. When snow plowing, we wish we can keep our driveways clean. We know it's an inconvenience for the residents, but it's the physics of removing snow from the street. 
our snowplow trucks take the snow from the center of the street and push it towards the curb. Um, if a resident has cleared the bottom of their driveway, uh, the snow coming off the plow will inevitably go into their driveway. You know, even before I started driving a plow, I, I, I kind of knew um, that the plow comes by and, you know, you get that, that roll of snow and you just got to go back out and do it. A lot of times we have residents that are unaware that it is against our regulations to blow snow into the street. Oh, we would really like people to be um, um, careful and to understand that we uh, stress safety with our drivers and that uh, we'd like the residents to be respectful of that. Piles of snow, they're attractive nuisances. Uh, they're, they're fun for kids to build snow forts, uh, sled off them, et cetera. A lot of times these at the ends of the driveway where a lot of the snow accumulates and can be pushed off from the roadway, we create these mounds. These mounds are incredibly attractive for kids to play in. It's a very dangerous situation. I mean, please make sure that children do not play in these mounds, do not create forts in these mounds. Yeah, sometimes uh, people have their, their, you know, plot, they're shoveling their driveway, they have the snow plow, they can't really hear. I'm asking people to be very aware of what's going on around them with the, the noise and the strobe lights, uh, paying attention to all of that. We want to make sure that you hear and see everything around you. It's very dangerous for you to be removing the snow with a snowblower out into the streets. We are a community of good neighbors. We ask all residents to help out to each other. Residents can help each other out, help their kids out in the neighborhood, all the pedestrians that walk through the area. We ask that all residents clear the snow from their sidewalk. Park, park cars can be a big challenge too. We don't have the ability to come back and clean up after where the cars were once before. As a member of Public Works, I do not want to damage any part of property with this plow. We, I want to open up the street and, and go home. Um, you know, a lot of times people, you get the old, you know, they'll, they'll park their car in front of their driveway and hope that the plow will swing around. Um, you're actually just, just making more work for your neighbor. Now all the snow from that I swung around is going up on there, so. Um, you know, city of good neighbors shall be in our driveways. So in an effort to provide more communication to residents, the Public Works Department has been using Village's Facebook page and the Twitter page in order to provide more instant updates to our residents. These updates can be anything uh, storm damage, winter maintenance activities. Uh, it's just another avenue for us outside of the Village's website to talk to our residents. Okay. So that material, <clears throat> excuse me, that video showed um, a, a good overview of how the village of Arlington Heights is using different v BMPs for snow management uh, to reduce uh, the amount of salt that they apply. They also covered a lot of other things that are relevant to winter management as well. And we thought that was an interesting overview before we got into each of the BMPs. And specifically, Arlington Heights was using this first BMP material storage uh, in an appropriate manner. Uh, they store, stored their salt and other materials in a dome. Um, and that is a recommended BMP under the Northern Virginia Salt Management Strategy as well. Um, De-icer piles um, should be enclosed or under cover um, to collect and contain any runoff if they do um, have uh, um, availability to any um, water or rain or snow. Um, liquid products should be double walled and uh, secondary containment. Uh, loading, hauling de-icers under, should occur under cover and make sure that you don't um, overload those hauling de-icers, that they um, have the appropriate amount of material uh, in them um, to make sure that you have your equipment cleaned um, and that you contain any wastewater. Um, all of these good housekeeping um, procedures um, policy should be in place um, as all part of a BMP to better maintain and store your materials. Um, and so your considerations under this BMP really are to eliminate the loss or, or waste of any materials, to capture any material uh, or green brine, for example, um, and to reduce additional capital costs or upfront costs because you're um, 
more efficiently containing your material and not losing any uh, unnecessarily to the environment. Next. The second BMP I want to cover is snow placement and where you put your snow. I mean, they, in the video, they specifically went into um, trying to keep the snow for residents in particular on their yards. Um, for more municipal or larger scale um, snow management, we want to make sure we snow we store the snow downhill from any of those de-icer storage areas and so make sure that that meltwater won't then go right into that storage area and carry any of your de-icer de off um, into storm drains. That helps by storing it downhill, you help eliminate waste. Um, it may sometimes limit space for other uses such as parking, but it's important to make sure that you are preventing that meltwater from going down um, hill into a storage area. And you really want to, when you place your snow, to avoid areas that drain directly to a water body. You wanna keep those pollutants from directly into entering the water bo body, and you want to contain those pollutants from the roadway or other de-icing de material um, by where you place the snow. Next. So, for any snow and ice management program, it is extremely beneficial to have a treatment plan in place. Um, as the slide notes, this allows for continual improvement. You're able to track and record um, your progress and any updates to your treatment. Also offers group learning opportunities. Um, and as we highlighted with BMPs in general, the goal is to be able to increase increase efficiencies within your plan. And so along with having a general treatment plan, um, we also recommend having ongoing meetings and communication. And this includes pre-storm meetings, um, general in-storm communications, and post-storm meetings. Um, and these meetings should typically include the maintenance staff, supervisors, property managers, and, and really any other partner that will be involved in operations. And pre and post storm meetings um, are great because they do allow for that scheduled coordination between the different levels of operation. Um, and it also provides the space to develop a strategic storm response. Um, in particular, for those post storm meetings, um, again, this is where you're, you're also creating the space for continual improvement. What went well, what went wrong? How can you update um, your application practices better for the next storm? So as a note, although these meetings can take time and uh, we recognize there's not always time to schedule a meeting before a storm happens. Um, again, it, it supports the process of a well-rounded program where all staff can share their knowledge and improve their practices before the next storm event. And so part of these communications can include preparations based off of weather forecasting and monitoring. Supervisors or, or other staff um, should obtain data relating to the start um, of snow or precipitation, the type of precipitation, um, the event length, um, temperature trends, and wind conditions. Um, again, we recognize that these can all quickly change, but it's helpful for you um, when you're deciding, A, which type of salt to potentially use, um, which we'll discuss a little bit further down the line, um, and B, how many staff you might need, um, and then just general other conditions to be able to apply salt. Um, and in general, having this weather forecasting and monitoring is helpful um, because it does allow for the maintenance staff to have a better idea of what type of application technique will be best um, and when to actually apply the salts to reduce snow and ice bonding to pavement. So the next two BMPs that I'm gonna go over um, have to do with managing areas within a small footprint such as stairways or other small areas. Um, and the first one is really looking for opportunities to close those areas off or to prevent the snow or ice from accumulating there in the first place. Um, that's not always possible, but where we're possible, look for those opportunities. Um, other opportunities or other um, ways to manage these small areas is to use a push shovel or, or a scoop shovel. 
I would use a broom or a blower for light snow. Um, also ice scrapers or ice chisels can be used to more efficiently uh, uh, clear snow from these areas um, and not use salt. Um, but overall, closing these areas or using these tools can reduce those needs for de-icers or the application of salt. Next. Another way is to apply the de-icer only in small areas. Um, one way to do this is to calculate the total amount um, of salt used or to keep track of it to make sure that you use um, as little as possible. And you can take an application rate that can be from the manufacturer of your device. I hear a handheld or spice can be spreader can be used for accuracy. And you take that application rate from the manufacturer times the area that you're using it to estimate the total amount of salt used and really try to concentrate the use of the salt only on the area you need it. So for example, here in the sidewalk that is shown, we would only be applying the salt to the sidewalk itself and uh, not to the areas adjacent to it, which could, in addition to wasting the amount of salt, uh, applied could damage the uh, vegetation in those areas. Next. Um, so as I mentioned, general weather forecasting for temperature um, is important. However, it's also important when applying salt to know the temperature of surfaces. Um, so there are a few different ways that we can track surface temperature that we have listed here. Um, and these typically range um, by cost and also frequency of temperature recording. Um, so certain services um, like DOT might use more regularly um, tracking uh, temperature recording systems. Whereas if you're um, with an HOA or other properties, having something like a handheld infrared system might be a better use for you. Um, I'll also note that the handheld sensors can be a great option because they can, can be purchased for relatively cheap at home improvement stores like Lowe's and Home Depot. So based on the temperature of surfaces, um, that way you are able to have a more efficient and precise technique for salt application um, and particularly for de-icing as well. And Moving on to equipment calibration, having a standardized calibration process is a really key uh, BMP. The calibration process should take into consideration um, calibration materials, auger and spinner speeds, and vehicle speeds. Um, and typically, equipment should be calibrated in the preseason as well as the midseason. Um, as well as generally when there is any type of change in the material that's used. It is important to track the settings that you use, um, including the rates and the output um, amount of salt um, so that you can refine it in the future. Um, and as a note, generally calibration is, is not very expensive um, and it is again beneficial for optimizing application rates. Um, which in turn results in reduced material use and costs, um, as well as those environmental impacts. Um, the one drawback to calibration is that it does take time to complete, um, and you may need to train your staff on how to complete the calibration process. So um, we do have a great video that goes into more detail on the calibration process. Um, as well as effective techniques to maximize that uh, salting application efficiency. Okay, we'll start with John Rose, but she talked. This is how we calibrate our sanders. To start with, we're going to work with our doors. For our door height, we want to measure from the top of the flight to the bottom of the door. This door is roughly four inches. From this point, we've got a smooth flow coming off. Right here, you can see we marked a spot on our bearing. If it's not turned, our shaft will make one revolution, and then we'll weigh that. That'll give us our pounds per revolution. And we're going to fire the truck up, and we're going to run through each of our Sanders settings. We'll go for one minute and count how many revolutions we're making in one minute. And then we'll put it on a spreadsheet, and we'll find out how many pounds per mile we're laying down. So we're going to use this tarp catch our load, and we'll bring it up. Let's use a simple scale. 
much like your grade scales. All right. Sure, we get everything off our spinner. Looks like we weighed about 43 pounds off one revolution. So now that we'll start doing this rest calibration. We'll set it on our settings. We'll count how many revolutions on that particular setting it's going to make in one minute. And then we will know pounds per mile. All right, we're cutting our door height down to three and a half inches. See if we can get our weight down a little bit to see what that's going to give to us as far as a revolution. So if you'll bring it around, let's get us a square cut again. And we'll do a revolution. So what our goal is, is to get a constant flow off without the avalanche. That way we don't have the plot in the road where you have a spot and then you white, then another spot of black. We're trying to get a, a constant steady flow at about 250 pounds a lane mile is the goal. About 36 pounds per revolution versus what we originally started with, about 43 pounds. So now we'll fire up and we'll count how many revolutions per minute. So what we're doing for one minute at each speed on our sander, we're going to count how many revolutions it makes. Now it'll let us know how many pounds we're putting down. Okay, so it looks like we're making six and a quarter revolutions. Well, that's going to start coming into play now. When we start filling out our form here. On our first setting, 43 pounds, we are laying down 268 pounds per minute. And if we go back to 36, we'll be laying down 225 pounds per minute. Chain speeds here, one through 10. This is going to be our rotations per minute. This is our pounds that we've weighed. For us, our average is 20 miles an hour. So we're trying to accomplish around 250 pounds per weight mile. So at this setting here, we are laying down 240 pounds per weight mile. Hi, I'm Daniel Campbell. I'm superintendent over Carbon County Road Department. It's really crucial, especially with budgets getting tight, that you take the time and set your standards up this way. It not only does it make you more effective at your job, it does help your budgets. And it, it saves a lot of downtime of your trucks running back to the salt pile, getting loaded. It actually puts them out on the road a lot longer, which gives you more bang for your buck, especially when you're paying overtime. Um, now that we've done all the calibrations and everything on our standard, the big thing is now you want your material to actually be on the road surface and not out in the bar ditch or onto your fresh snow that you're gonna plow off with your next pass. It's really crucial your doors on the insides of your spreader here are set properly so that material's hitting the spinner and dropping directly behind your truck and not being thrown out into the weeds or off the shoulder of the road or onto your next travel lane that you're gonna plow off. Um, three things essentially affect that. The doors in here, your flats on your side and your spinner speed. Spinner speed is really, really crucial. Um, you can have your flap set relatively low and still end up with material going off the shoulder of the road if your drivers are turning your spinner speeds up too fast. Mm -hmm. And drivers do like to do that because it helps them see the material. A lot of times when they're 
going, especially late at night, they feel like their sander has maybe quit them. And so they're not dropping any material out. They don't want to get out of the truck, safety reasons, everything else. And so they'll pick that spinner up where they can see it coming out past their mud flaps on their driver's side. Essentially, you're wasting material. So now that you've got 250 pounds per lane mile going on the road, or should be going on the road, now it's going in the bar ditch or on your next travel lane that you're going to plow off. And uh, we'll do a quick demonstration of how far your spinners actually broadcast with your doors open or closed or different spinner settings. So here you can see how far out past the truck it's actually going with where that door is set. It's not doing too bad on this side, but we're going to wipe all of our salt off the road on our next pass. So see now how we're putting it right directly behind us. So now we're getting our material on the road. Now we've cut down to 50% and it's virtually right behind our truck. So just by a simple door setting, you can control your material even if you have a high spinner setting. We're getting a little bit maybe coming off of the shoulders, maybe 3%, but 90% of our material is right where we need it, right in the travel lane. This is where it all comes into play. Once you've calibrated your sanders, you've done all the steps, this is what you want to see out on your road, is your material actually ending up in the travel surface to your road, rather than off your bar ditch or just a nice little string down the, down the road. So it helps your traffic pack it, and essentially gets us back to black what we're all at. Okay. So again, as I mentioned, having a set calibration process um, saves money and ensures that you're applying salts where they need to be applied uh, for maximum safety. Um, and it's a relatively simple process and doesn't require a ton of materials to do. So incorporating that into a treatment plan um, is important. Thanks, Rebecca. Another way to make sure you're actually applying your de-icer where you want it to go uh, is to use a dyed de-icer. Um, many times these will come um, different colors based on the different manufacturer brands and they're readily available out there. Um, the dyed de-icer provides a visual demonstration of where you've applied the de-icer and the amount of coverage, uh, which is very beneficial, not just so the public can see that you're putting that de-icer out there and understand that those areas are safer places to walk or to drive, um, but it also reduces the um, amount of material that you apply and keeps you from uh, applying it in excess. Um, it's overall a better way to manage the application of your de-icer. Now, some dyes can stain, and it's also important to look at the, uh, the bag itself and, and the ingredients that are in the dye de-icer material to avoid harmful chemicals. But overall, this is a good best practice to use, particularly for sidewalks and other small areas uh, where it's important for the applicator and the public to see where the de-icer has been applied. Next. So the next BMP um, is a couple slides because it's a large one. And we also have a video embedded in here. Uh, and this BMP is enhanced equipment and technology. Uh, this is something that's evolving over time. Uh, so when the salt management strategy uh, was completed for this region in 2020, uh, there were certain um, technologies um, that were more in use now than even just two years later. Um, and then there are other some uh, uh, technologies that are still under development that I'll talk about on the, on the next slide. Um, but we'll start with plows, the simple, simple technologies, um, which can include side wing plows that cover an increased area. Um, another um, type of plow that can cover, uh, cover an increased uh, larger area are tow plows. 
Um, and then there's also the use of flexible or sectional blades, which can be better used on uneven surfaces to better scrape the surface and remove that snow or ice um, that the plow is intending to remove. There are also spreaders, um, which uh, can provide a lower uh, de-icer delivery rate. And also spreaders um, can be used to lock the amount of delivery, uh, the, um, excuse me, the amount of material um, that is applied to locking the delivery rate. Uh, and this, um, these mechanisms can also be used to track the amount of de-icer that is applied. Um, and then there are also liquid products. Um, uh, there's um, additional equipment that is needed with the use of a, a, a brine or liquid product, including those that are listed here. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, cost prohibitive, um, and, but overall the use of brine uh, we've seen um, based on information from applicators in the area has increased and there's more acceptance and understanding of the benefits of using a brine to reduce the amount of uh, salt needed, but also to maintain that safety that we're looking for with winter snow management. Next. So this is a video uh, that we'll be showing to you uh, that demonstrates this a little bit more with a concentration on calibration and showing some new techni technology that um, isn't in avail available. And like with all of these new technologies, um, as they are um, introduced, they may be expensive, but over time the cost can come down as they're more widely used. Uh, and this is one such technology. Hey guys, I'm Jonathan Schultz with the City of Cudhay Public Works. I'd like to show you the two most important settings you need to check when you're getting your salt trucks ready for the season. First thing you need to check is ground speed. You can go to the lower right to calibration menu, ground speed, and down to axle pulses. You can go use that auto cal feature. You'll drive exactly one mile and it will record your axle pulses per mile and it'll figure out the vehicle speed that way. This truck from the factory it was reading 10 miles an hour too fast when we're applying salt. The second most important setting to check is your pound rev. You'll go down to truck, auger, material settings. You'll go down to displacement. You can use the auto cal function to choose portable scale. You'll run this at about 30%. It'll count the turns as you dump out salt. You'll weigh it up. You know, we dumped 280 pounds. You hit next, and it will divide the weight that you dumped out by how many auger turns there were. Ours is 14.2 pounds per revolution. From the factory, it said 10.0 pounds per revolution. So it was dumping about 40% more than it thought it was. Next, we can go through and I'll show you a quick way to do a drop test and check that everything's functioning and our calibration is correct. You can go into the menu and enable options, sim speed. So it can simulate a speed and your rate that you're dropping while you're standing still and you can weigh it. So if you go to sim speed and the easy way is 30 miles an hour for two minutes, that's one mile. So you should be able to get 200 pounds, 300 pounds per mile, whatever you have it set for that's how much weight you should actually have on the ground that's your check so we've got our sim speed set at 30 miles an hour we're going to do a two minute test so that should be one mile and we should have 200 on the ground that's what we had set for we'll weigh it up when this is done so here we're just scooping it up we can use something as simple as a little scale here um uh, usually it's around 60 pounds per bucket we'll, we'll weigh up this whole pile and we should have our 200 pounds so now just for we kind of do this backwards because our trucks were already dialed in but i went ahead set the truck back to stock parameters how it comes from the factory i know everybody thinks a brand new truck is ready to go and that's the gold standard of like comparing it to your other trucks but that's not the case. The parameters in there will just get salt out of the back. Now we went ahead, put it all back to the stock parameters, stock speed, and we're going to do the same 30 miles an hour for two minutes for a one mile drop test. And we will see how much, how much of a difference between our calibrated pile 
and then to our uncalibrated pile. All right, so we finished our test. This is the uncalibrated where we set it back to stock. This one's over double the weight as our calibrated. With this one mile simulation, using the truck as it is set brand new from the factory, when we thought we were putting down 200 pounds per mile, we were actually applying more than double the rate at 407 pounds per mile. This, it doesn't look like that much of a difference, but this just shows you can't drive behind the truck and adjust on the fly and say, hey, turn it up, turn it down. I know that's the way when I first started here, you'd follow behind the truck and say, oh, turn it up, turn it down. That's too much. That, you cannot tell by doing it that way. There's no possible way uh, because we don't even know what the weight is until we actually put it in the, in the bucket and weigh it. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned a little something. I try to keep this short, to give an accurate demo. <laughs> Pause it there. <laughs> okay. Great. So that was uh, an interesting video that shows some uh, more advanced technology that can be used for calibration purposes, but ultimately um, it can reduce the amount of salt you apply. It can better um, track and actually apply the salt where you want it to go. And then also, um, and a lot as with a lot of these, um, technologies I'll be talking about uh, on this slide here um, will um, increase driver safety. If the driver is more aware of uh, what he's applying and more conf or she or, and confident in what they're applying, then they're less likely to get out of their vehicle in, um, in an unsafe condition. Another technology is automated, automated vehicle location or AVL fleet tracking. I can provide the location of your fleet and better track where they're going and make sure that you have adequate coverage. Um, and it can also have a track spreader application rate, which um, assists with all the things that we've been talking about here with calibrations and tracking the amount of uh, salt that you actually apply, um, thereby reducing the amount that you apply. Another is the Maintenance Decision Support System, or MDSS. This has been developed by the Federal Highway Administration, and it utilizes map data in real time uh, to uh, assess map, uh, conditions um, via the map and utilize that data to better um, deploy your fleet um, to areas that are needed and to make sure that you also have that coverage overall for a larger area. Another um, uh, technology that's not used as much in this area, but you do see it used in some of the northern states. I know they're using it some in New Hampshire. It was developed by the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and it uses LIDAR data to do precision de-icing. Um, there's some pilot pro programs that are out there, um, but essentially this technology uh, utilizes real-time conditions on the roadways to more precisely apply de-icing materials. Next. So I previously discussed um, abrasive, some of those pros and cons for use. Um, again, they can be used to prevent slipping and, and help with traction on certain surfaces. Um, when using abrasives, um, they can be stored with a de-icing agent to prevent clumping. Um, but I want to note that it's important um, that sand and other salts do not necessarily need to be used together. Um, so specifically with de-icers, um, it's not always necessary uh, to have abrasives um, once the salts are already um, melting the snow and ice. Um, so being cognizant of, of when the best opportunities for abrasives are, again, as I mentioned, um, for smaller surface areas, such as um, certain sidewalks, um, it's typically the best option. And then um, a few notes um, for BMPs on post-storm cleanup. Uh, first, it's always important to clean up any leftover de-icers and abrasives after the weather event to prevent them from running off into the surrounding environment. Um, and having a cleanup plan should be incorporated into any salt management plan and communicated with your maintenance staff um, and other partners prior to the event. In general, having just a basic storm cleanup um, plan 
not only reduces waste so that you are potentially able to reuse um, some of those materials, um, but again, it's also protecting the environment so that any excess material isn't running off into surrounding uh, waterways or the environment. So the next BMP we wanted to present was on the spinner setup and a few of the videos that we've seen already talked a little bit about this. So you saw the one where they had the sides on the spinner to make sure that it didn't go out too far to the side and the salt application or material, um, whatever material you're applying actually goes and stays in the roadway or where you're intending it to go. Another um, thing to check with how you set up your spinner um, is to the possibility of using a chute or a set of spinners that are closer to the ground to reduce the bounce and scatter and make sure the material stays where it's intended. Um, looking at um, the way you set up your spinner and making sure that it's maintained properly uh, is a more efficient use of de-icer and can reduce the amount of de-icer that is applied. Now, this is not impossible on all equipment, but for equipment where it is possible, checking the setup of your spinner and making sure you're using the available technologies that can fit uh, to reduce the amount of bounce and scatter and to better um, direct the um, material that you're using um, to the area that it's intended is, is an important BMP for consideration in your salt management strategy. Next. Another one is uh, driving an appropriate speed limit, not going too fast, not going too slow, and making sure that you have an even application of your de-icer. Uh, it's suggested to drive between 17 miles per hour and 25 miles per hour on most roadways. Obviously, it will depend on the type of roadway that you're on um, and, and the, the size of your roadway, whether there are cars um, on the side or whether you're on a large highway. But it's trying to stay within this range will help um, reduce the amount of de-icer that you apply, uh, reducing the amount that is applied in areas that you don't want it to go and making sure that it is uh, applied more evenly and consistently on the uh, surface. Um, this is a more efficient and consistent application, and it can reduce the costs and environmental impacts overall for all the reasons what we've been talking about here today. Now, it's not always possible to maintain the speed, but it is recommended that you do where so possible to reduce the amount of de-icer applied. Next. So um, if you are applying salt onto high-speed roads, um, de should be applied or try to be applied in the center of the road or on the high side of a curve. Um, and as Ginny mentioned, again, uh, this is the most efficient use of de-icer because it's reducing any of that unnecessary material applied and it reduces potential environmental impacts by having that excess salt um, run off into waterways. Um, so again, we recognize that this is not always possible depending on the equipment that you have um, or the roadway that you're applying salt to, um, but if possible, it should be a general goal. Um, however, on any road, um, particularly those with stoplights or, or other um, stop signs, um, applicators should try to turn off the auger or shoot or conveyor um, when they are stopped. Um, and again, this is helping to reduce any of that unnecessary material used. Um, and again, we recognize this is not possible with all equipment, um, but it will help reduce costs um, in the long run. Another BMP is um, to consider reducing the application rate on successive passes that you may uh, make with equipment. Um, the first time through, um, you may use a, an application rate based on the temperature and, and the timing, um, whether it's um, before or after a snow event. And with a successive pass, uh, depending on the storm and um, what's going on with the uh, um, amount of uh, precipitation, you may be able to reduce the application rate on those successive passes as you go through. Um, again, this is a more efficient use of de-icer and leverages the de-icing capacity of the remaining de-icer that you have on hand. Um, it's a time and material saving and protects the environment, looking at that balance between uh, the environment and uh, the application of salt for safety and for the economy. 
Um, now to do this, it may require some trial and error or experience to do this effectively, but it's something that can be considered as you look at developing your salt management strategy from year to year and also from storm to storm. Next. Plan of attack and developing a spread plan, uh, pattern, in particular for spreaders for sidewalks. Um, as you're, if you're covering a large area of sidewalks and as you're developing your spread pattern plan um, ahead of an event, it's important to survey the property and develop or plan for that pattern. That can prevent application of the ICER in areas that either haven't have, have already been treated or areas that don't require treatment or even areas where you do not want uh, that de-icer material uh, to be applied and to accumulate. And this is for spreaders for sidewalks. Um, an example could be using a drop spreader um, or a rotary spreader that has shields on the sides to better direct the de-icer, keep it from shooting off the sidewalk into vegetated areas where it can cause more damage. Next. Um, so another important best management practice here is varying application rates by conditions. Um, application rates should be based on several factors, including pavement and surface temperature, precipitation rating type, um, and the levels of service, as you see here, cycle time and bare pavement regain time. Um, this does require some additional training and equipment, um, typically that has spreader settings. Um, but the benefits really do outweigh those costs for improved service and safety. Um, you can see on the table to the right how temperature ranges um, also vary by product type, which could, should be taken into consideration when you purchase um, the different types of salt. And just um, building off the table when we use de-icers, again, it's critical to know the temperature ranges for applications. Um, because they can become ineffective outside of that temperature range. So in a salt management plan, it's helpful to have notes for which de-icers you plan to use at different temperatures, um, but also um, make sure to purchase adequate amounts of each de-icer depending on your location. Um, and this, again, is helpful when you're tracking so that you have an idea from past years which um, type of product you use most. Um, I will say a downside to this is that if you are having um, several of those products, you do need to have the space to be able to store them. Um, and it can require additional training to use those different de-icing types. So again, um, based off of this, it is helpful to have a plan for those different conditions um, and when you might want to use the different materials and equipment. So, here we want to highlight um, pre-treating de-icers, which typically means using brine. And brine is a great option because it uses less materials. Um, it also has lower application rates, which in turn reduces material costs. And in general, it's better for the environment by sticking to pavement, um, unlike other um, salts, right, that we say bounce off of the road and run off into the surrounding environment. Um, and then pre-treating a load um, can be completed in a, a spread or truck bed. Um, but when a load is pre-treated, it does need to be stored in a covered area to prevent any leaking into the environment. So as you can see here on the slide, um, having storage on a covered pad is recommended. So the next BMP, um, more specifically, I'd like to talk about um, pre-wet de-icers. Um, these can be used and, and can be very efficient in cold temperatures and can be more efficient than pre-treating. Um, it's an, another BMP that can reduce your material costs and, um, and, and um, better protect the environment through reducing the amount of brine uh, salt um, applied. This is a, um, a BMP where the slurry can be made at the point of application and dropped directly into place where you want it to be dropped and begin working immediately. It works with a higher liquid to de-icer ratio. Um, and so therefore you're using less de-icer, less salt um, and can be applied on heavy traffic routes. Um, and it's where a, a liquid, typically a brine uh, to salt is applied 
directly to the surface, uh, melting, uh, speeding up the melting process and helping the material stick to the surface so you have a, a better and more efficient effect um, for the de-icer itself. Next. A similar BMP is direct liquid application. Um, this is where we're applying mixtures of water and de-icer directly to the surface with no lag time. It can be performed during or after a storm and is also very efficient uh, for use in cold temperatures. Um, it also, like many of these BMPs, um, the goal of this training is to reduce um, the material amount of material used and thereby reducing the amount of cost uh, for your snow management. It can help you achieve a level, a high level of service and safety. And um, although there, it's um, some of the equipment is often expensive for the liquids production, storage, and application. Um, over time, it, you can see reduced costs in those materials costs, and also a more efficient, efficient and effective use of the materials. Now, this is a relatively new process, and there's limited experience out there. It's not something that we see necessarily a lot in our region, especially in smaller areas. Um, but it may be something that we are looking to use more in the future as costs come down, as people gain more experience with it, and as there's more uh, of a desire to reduce the amount of salt applied. Next. So overall, with the different application types, it's really important to have a standardized process to measure and record your de-icer um, used to overall just help you improve those efficient application rates over time. Um, some ways that this can be done is by automating the process of measuring de-icer use with the different types of technology that is out there. Um, I'll note it's also helpful to use more than one method to check these values, um, just so that you're ensuring that your methodology um, is correct and accurate. And over time, again, recording your performance, recording the amount of salt that you're using, you do have a record for your application rates, um, and you can track and really see where target application rates may have been exceeded in different um, time frames. So, again, as I mentioned um, earlier, is it's an iterative iterative process. Um, so, being able to go back on an annual basis. Um, and see your performance um, can only make your application process better. And lastly, um, as we discussed today, having a standard operating procedure um, or SOP and salt management plan um, is a key, MP, key BMP to ensure that you um, have consistent operations among your staff, um, but also just a living document uh, to track, again, the materials, the equipment, um, and time. So with that, it really provides an effective project man management tool in the long run. Um, but it also provides the opportunity for supervisors and other staff to track any lessons learned over time. Um, and again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, you're really able to target where efficiencies have been met. Um, so again, an iterative process, you can see um, on the bottom right, continuous improvement, and that's why it's a living document. So um, you can update your application methods, your planning, um, the types of equipment that you use over time to help maximize your efficiency, reduce your costs, um, and again, keep that in line with um, reducing those impacts on the environment. So um, just an example on um, having that key planning strategy in place, including having meetings and an operating procedure. Um, we have a video actually from Ohio State where they go into detail about this a little bit further. Uh, we got about an inch of snow on the ground. Um, headed into work to start getting it cleared up, get campus clear. If you have a job to do, so you just get up and deal with it and go do it. People expect to have clean sidewalks and somewhere to walk when they get up in the morning. Right around 2.30 in the morning, the bulk of our crews began arriving on campus. They meet with the supervisors. The supervisors assign tasks and they send them out on their different routes across the campus. We have about 
30 people that uh, reported also. We try to be here before it starts. By the way, we have a, a good grip on it when it snows. You, know, you, not, you can snap your fingers and say, okay, it's, it's all gone. It's, you know, we, we, we get out here and we do what we have to do. Um, Groundskeepers in the landscape shops, they're the ones who have to focus on all the pedestrian access routes. Well, I'm hitting just the main walks right now, so going down uh, Woodruff and 17. Campus shop focuses on the streets. They have the large, the large salt trucks like you would see in any city. Those are the guys out there taking care of roads and streets. We have a lot of breakdowns. It's equipment. It gets used quite a bit. Yeah, there is going to be breakdowns. Every storm is different. When we get a lot of snow, we just go straight pretty much to plowing, just plowing and just moving this material off of our papers. And then we'll go back and salt as we can. We're really fortunate in Harold Ohio State to have a truly dedicated group of groundskeepers and surface maintenance technicians. These folks, their normal schedule, Monday through Friday, first shift. We ask them during the winter time to cover uh, round the clock. We do really feel good about the fact that we got this done. And we know that a lot of people appreciate the fact that we've been out here doing this. So that's an interesting example, right? It's not necessarily within a town, but um, you do have all those uh, sidewalks and walkways um, associated with a college campus. We're having that operating procedure in place is critical to make sure that, you know, when people are moving to classes, um, all the grounds are cleared. Great, well, thanks, Rebecca. So th this is concludes our uh, training on salt management. Um, hope you've been able to learn something here. Um, I have here the, the what, why, how, um, the what was the salt management application and hopefully developing a salt management strategy for your particular area where you manage the snow. Um, the why, the safety, the water quality, the inf infrastructure maintenance, um, as well as the economic um, and uh, environmental overall um, considerations. The how, we presented a number of uh, available technologies and techniques, our best management practices, as, as we term them, or BMPs. Um, one of the most important ones, really probably, uh, and I think Rebecca would agree, is that pre-planning that she went over first um, to make sure you're really looking at, um, at, at what your plan is for any given snow event and making sure you have the equipment and technologies in place, as well as the training of your staff in place ahead of an event, as well as coordination with other agencies that may be removing snow also in the area. Um, and the ultimate goal here is that balance between safety, um, the economy, and the environment. And so as you've gone through this training, we hope you've been thinking about those uh, questions that we asked you at the beginning, um, whether you think your current practices are efficient and environmentally friendly, and if you think there's any ways that you could improve those. And hopefully today, um, we've had the opportunity to think about that, and we've presented some things that you may want to uh, include um, in either improving or developing your salt management strategy for the coming winter. Thank you very much.